Sunday. Good evening, everybody. It's Pastor Mike, His Grace Church, right here in beautiful San Antonio, Texas, man, where we're touching lives and we're changing hearts tonight, man. Amplify. Amplify is we're turning up the heat every Thursday night with practical teaching for everyday living. And tonight's not going to be any different, man. His Grace Church, a destination for divine visitation. And so we're going to open with a word of prayer. We're going to get right in the Word of God. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you exactly what we're going to be discussing tonight in our Bible lesson. Amen? So, dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you tonight with open hearts and minds, eager to dive into your Word. And I tell you, your Word is so good. So we thank you for the opportunity to gather together tonight in fellowship and also as well in study. Lord, we ask you for your presence to be among us as we explore the Word of God tonight. Grant us wisdom and understanding so that we may fully grasp the truths that you have laid out for us. Father, help us to apply as well what we learn to our daily lives, growing closer to you and becoming better reflections of your love. And Father, I pray tonight that this, may this lesson be guided by your Holy Spirit. May our hearts be united in, des in a desire to know you more deeply. And I pray that this time of study will not only strengthen our faith, deepen our relationship with you, and inspire us to live out, our, out uh, uh, your teachings in all that we do. And I boldly declare tonight that my uh, teaching and will not be just with enticing words and man's wisdom and knowledge, but in demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost. And we ask all this tonight in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And so tonight we're going to be talking about living blessed. Amen. And how we are to align our heart with God's purpose when it comes to success and generosity. I don't know about you, but I want to live blessed. Amen. So often we as believers call ourselves blessed. But the reality of it is if you look at our life, we could actually be people. People wouldn't want to live our lives many times, you know, because it, it seems as though there's a portion of it whether in our physical bodies or in our... Can you open that door back up, Pastor Mark? Uh, whether in our physical bodies or in our finances, it seems like the curse is still in operation, even though Christ has redeemed us from the curse of law, according to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. The Bible says in Galatians 3 and 13 that Christ redeemed us from the curse of law, being made a curse for us. Curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. So I don't know about you, but I want to live on the blessing side of the street. Amen? I want to live in the abundance, the fulfillment of the, all the promises of God, which are yes and amen. I want to live where God told me I can live. And so uh, if you're not sure how to get there, I tell you, join us on Sunday morning because we're talking about in our, in our series on Sunday morning, Speaking Faith speaking words of faith, and that'll help you and encourage you then to rearrange maybe some of the things you're doing to get in line with the promises of God that, that will allow you to live blessed. And then also, I encourage you that all, this is our 27th week in this particular subject, and so all of our studies are, are out on our website at www.hgc.church. Uh, forward slash resources. You can find us on YouTube, uh, Facebook, man, and they're all free. We, we don't charge you for anything, any materials. I mean, we put them out there so that you can develop and grow. So then it's up to you to take advantage of them. And so uh, the series that we're, we're talking about tonight, Living Blessed, is in the good life. So, and, I, and I hope through this study on finances that, I don't know, maybe you're getting a little excited about discovering God's will for your life and maybe even how to live a better life that you already have. I know I am. And I don't really, you know, and so the other thing I, I find very encouraging is that to know that God wants us to be blessed and successful. He wants that for us. He doesn't want you humble and broke and poor. He wants you blessed and successful. And here's the thing. God's blessings just don't stop with us. Did you know that? God's blessings just don't. He wants everyone and, and wants to use us. He loves everyone, and He wants to use us uh, to be a blessing to the world through our generosity. I tell you, there's nothing better than blessing people when you have the power and the resources to do it, when they're, when they're going through stuff, and you can just reach into your surplus and say, I know you're having a difficult time. Here, 
Amen? Here's, here's a little extra capital to just get you through. And your, your blessing and your resource could be their miracle. Hallelujah. And so I like being used of God to be somebody else's miracle because the joy that comes upon their face when they receive the promise that they've been believing for is substantial. And so we're called then that, you know, not only to be blessed, but we can also be a blessing to others. And to really live out this blessed to be a blessing mindset, then we need to take a good look at our heart and our motives, right? And so in the next few studies, in the next few weeks, we're going to dive into that mindset and that topic as well. We're going to be talking about our heart. So here's the question, uh, so here's the question that I want to ask you tonight. What drives you to want success? Think about that. What drives you to want success? Is it so that you can be a good steward of what God gives you and bring Him honor and glory? Is it so you can be generous to others, support your local church, or spread the gospel around the world? I mean, I tell you what, I dream about supporting ministries and seeing the gospel go out. You know, that's just in my heart. Lord, if you, not if you bless me, but I want to be a blessing to the missionaries. I want to see the gospel um, go forth unhindered. And so often what hinders the gospel is finances. Churches are struggling today because of, of, of well, how do I say it politely? The inconsistency of, of, of people in their giving. Um, not only the inconsistency, but, but the, um, oh, I don't have a, uh, unfaithfulness, or not, not unfaithfulness, um, just living for themselves and giving when and how they want, and, and, and not honoring God with their first fruits. And so, um, when, so my desire in my heart is then to be able to bless People, to be able to sow into life-giving ministries that are going around the world and reaching the Gospels, to help other pastors maybe that are, are just getting off the ground like we once did. You know, when, when we started the church, there, there was just Pastor Kim and I and one or two other people. Amen? And so the finances were, were not all that great in the beginning. And we were trusting God. We were believing God. And other churches came alongside. Now, they didn't give financially, but, I mean, they gave us old used equipment. And you know what? At that time, I didn't care. Hallelujah. It was equipment. And it, and it, it did what it was supposed to do. It allowed us then to, to go forth and to preach the gospel in an amplification. Um, we believe God for chairs, uh, you know, I, I remember Pastor Mark, he, he loaned us some chairs for a while, and those chairs were great. And then one day he said, I need them back. And so, hallelujah. So we believe God for chairs. And so people came alongside and helped us and assisted us. And so that's in my heart as well. And so the question is, what's in your heart? Uh, <clears throat> um, or... Is it more for you about impressing your family and friends about how good you have it? Maybe it's about living a comfortable, luxurious lifestyle. That's why you want to be successful. There's nothing wrong with living comfortable. Amen? Some people are skeptical, skeptical, skeptical about the idea of Christians pursuing success, especially when they see others doing it for selfish or greedy reasons. Many people, they only pursue their success for me, myself, and I. Many Christians pursue their success, me, myself, and I, and what's left over, maybe we'll, we'll give something to God. And you have to understand, it's, it's God that gives you the power to get wealth. And that, word, that word, basically, when if you look at it in, 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 the, in the Hebrew, it means it's, it's God that gives you the ability to be successful. It's God that gives you the ability to be successful. So we honor God then by, by giving of our resources and providing for his kingdom because he's the ultimately the one that has brought you the success. Yeah, you went to school. Hallelujah. You got your education. But I'm telling you that the favor of God which rests upon you has opened doors 
And because maybe in the beginning of your career you were faithful to sow into the kingdom of God, God then blessed your hand. And so as you began to gather and receive and gain and then work somehow got to be a priority and God got to be secondary and pretty soon you're not taking care of anything that has to do with God's business. And, you know, that's where we have to check our heart. No matter how successful you are, you have to remember that it's God has given you that ability to be successful. And so we are to bring our first fruits, the first of everything we have, into the storehouse. Where's the storehouse? That's your local church. We bring that into the storehouse, and then the Bible says, then our barns will be filled with plenty. Hallelujah. But if your heart's not right, and then, you know, you, you've heard it before. If your heart's not right, God can't bless you. That's saying God won't bless you. God's still going to bless you. But you decide, you determine the amount of, of reciprocal, um, re reciprocal um, that you get back from God. He says, I'll open up the window of heaven and pour out blessing where there's not room enough for you to contain it. Well, I want that window open, don't you? In Malachi chapter, how do I do that? I bring the tithe into the storehouse. And so if we'll honor God with our first fruits, then he said he'll open the window of heaven. So again, we come back, it becomes a heart decision. It's, it's a matter of the heart. Are you, are, 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 is your heart towards God or away from God? If it's towards God, then you'll honor God in all you do. If it's not, you'll be building your own kingdom. If you honor God, you're building his kingdom. If you honor you, you're building your kingdom. And so that's why, that's why uh, people notice that, that some believers get really excited about wealth, but they don't show maybe the same enthusiasm for serving God, giving to others, or, or even living a holy life. And if you really think about it, they've got a point, don't they? It's a contradiction that can confuse others and even lead some people away from their faith. And that's why God is so concerned about the condition of our heart. Before, and, and so before we go any further within this study of success, let's take a moment and reflect on where our hearts really are, all right? And so what are our true motives for wanting God's blessing, and what is His, pur what is his purpose in providing them to us? Would be a great question. And, you know, I'll tell, I'll tell you mine, as they say, if you tell me yours. And so I have a twofold goal, if you will. Number one, I'm not going to deny it. I want to live a good and comfortable life. I want to live a comfortable life, don't you? I don't want to live uh, in the withouts, almost, barely getting by. I don't want to live down on Poverty Alley. Do you? I mean, I, I, I've, been, I've been poor. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I don't want to be poor no more. I want to live in a comfortable lifestyle. And so my comfortability may be different than your comfortability. My comfortability includes having all my bills paid and then a little in savings and then left over to do some things I want to do. Hallelujah. That's my comfortability. And so... The other thing is that I, I want to enjoy the aspects of the fruit of my labor. I work hard. In, in 1 Timothy, is this making sense to you tonight? 1 Timothy, it's awful quiet. I need Cora. Cora, you need to come back. It's awful quiet here. <laughs> you know, I had a, 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 a Bible teacher that used to say to say to us, is a, are, are you here or are you gone home? I'm just going to, I'm going to come down where I can see the whites of your eyes. <laughs> Amen. So are you here or are you gone home tonight? So 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17, it says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Your money's unreliable. Isn't that interesting? Because people think that if you just had money, oh, all of my problems would be over. But you know, money gathereth quick, the Bible says in Proverbs, picks up wings and flies away. If you don't learn how to be a good steward and manage what you have and the resources that you have in the little, when you get a lot, you're not going to have it for long. And so their trust 
it should be in God. Because why? Money's unreliable. Your trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. He provides everything that we need for our enjoyment. Everything that we... Say that with me. He provides everything I need for my enjoyment. Amen. He does. He provides everything. And so... Where money is unreliable, God is trustworthy. He is not unreliable. He's stable. He's firm in his foundations. He's firm in his belief. And, he's fir and he said if, in Isaiah 55, verse 11, he said, So shall my word go forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that which it was sent out to do. Then he said, I'll watch over my word to perform it. And if you're still not sure, the Bible says, you know, heaven and earth is going to pass away, but his word will remain forever. Amen. Hallelujah. There's, there's a stable foundation in the Word of God. Your finances, your, your money is unreliable, but God is trustworthy. Amen? He is trustworthy. And believe it or not, God wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to enjoy life. And that's why He provides everything that we need to make that possible. And so He provides. Take, for example, the meaning of the statement, give us all we need for our enjoyment. What this statement does is it tells us that God is the source of all blessings. Amen. All blessings. He is the source of all blessings. And when we look at this phrase, who richly gives us, this phrase emphasizes that God is the ultimate source of all good things in our life. The ultimate source of all good things in our life. We could say it like this. He's not stingy. Or limited in what he provides, but gives abundantly and generously. And when we use this word abundantly, it means in large quantities. More than enough or plentiful. When God is taking care of your business, it's going to be in abundance. It's going to be in large quantities. Hallelujah. It's going to be more than enough. Amen. And it's going to be plentiful. When you're trying to take care of your business, I tell you what, it ain't going to be as abundant. It ain't going to be as plentiful. You may think it is, oh, I'm doing really well, but wait till you get God involved in your business. He said, I will supply all your need according to my riches. Not your riches, but my riches. My unlimited resources in glory. That's what I'm going to do. What are you going to do? He said, again, coming back to Malachi, he said, bring the tithe and the offering into the storehouse. People just, they want to just talk about the tithe, but he convicted, he came, he came and said to the Israelites, he said, you're stealing from me. He said, w you know, some translation says you're robbing from me. And they said, well, huh, where are we robbing from you? He said, in tithes and in offerings. In tithes and an offering. And then he said, if you, will, if you will bring these tithes and offerings into the storehouse, which is at that time, which was the temple. So the provision is you're to bring your, your tithe and offering into, the, into where you are locally being fed. If you're part of His Grace Church, then His Grace Church is where you send it or bring it. I don't like the word send. I think you should bring it. Amen? Bring it on. And so, then he says, if you'll do this, test me. Prove me. Prove me in this point if I will not open the window of heaven and pour out blessing where there's not room enough for you to receive it. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. And so, when we look at, when we look at this, God says, and any time we talk, we see the, 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 the usage of window or windows of heaven in the Old Covenant, we always saw miraculous, plentiful, abundant supply. Hallelujah. And so, when God's involved in your business, you're not going to come up shortchanged. There's going to be abundance. There's going to be plenty, leftovers. Hallelujah. Large quantities. More than enough. And this particular word, abundantly, often conveys the idea of something being provided in overflowing or excessive manner, going beyond what is merely sufficient or necessary. 
You know, it's, it's important for you to understand, many times people are praying for, to God, they need a financial miracle. Now, I've done the same thing. Nothing wrong with that. And when a miracle shows up, a miracle will only meet the exact need. Usually there's nothing over and above, especially in the financial realm. I've seen it time and time again. Pastor Kim and I are believing. I know other people believe in God for things. And when it shows up, it's almost to the, I, 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 the exact penny. Uh, and I'll always sometimes ask the Lord, is it now, what would have hurt you, you know, to like another 20 bucks? You know, we got, got something to eat or, you know. But a miracle only covers that immediate need. But a blessing, a blessing goes well beyond that. And it provides overflowing. It's provided in an excessive manner. It goes beyond what is merely sufficient or necessary. That's why, that's why it says, my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. His. Hallelujah. His riches. Abundant. Over exceeding. Plenteous. More than enough. Going beyond. Hallelujah. The necessary. And so when we look again at the word abundant in a broader sense, it can refer to richness, fullness, or an ample supply of something. Some of you need an ample supply of some things in life, right? Whether it's material resources, opportunities, or even intangible qualities like love, joy, blessing. But on the other hand, the word generously means giving or sharing in a way that is abundant, kind, and without hesitation or stinginess. And it reflects, it reflects a willingness then to provide more than what is necessary or expected often out of a sense of kindness, compassion, and goodwill. And so, <clears throat> when someone acts generously, they do so with an open heart, offering their resources, their time, or support freely and abundantly. So, when we see the words abundantly and generously, when they're working together, what they do is they emphasize the idea of giving or providing in a way that is both plentiful and then done with a willing and open heart. Because abundantly speaks to the quantity or extent of what is given. Something provided in large amounts, overflowing, more than enough, where generously then focuses on the manner of spirit or spirit in which something is given, Freely, kindly, and without holding back. I want you to know God is giving you generously. He meets all your needs generously. Freely, kindly, and he doesn't hold back. And when these words are used together, then what they do is they describe an action or provision that is both vast in amount, or we could use the word abundant, and done with a kind and selfless attitude. Generous. Amen. For example... If someone gives abundantly and generously, they are not only providing a lot, but doing so with the desire to truly help or bless others without expecting anything in return. And what this combination does is it highlights both the quantity and the quality of giving or provision. I don't know about you, but that kind of sounds like God, right? That sounds like God. But without hesitation, this is what we are to be as well. Not just God. This is what we are to be as well. And if you're unsure, let me answer that with a yes, and then also provide you scriptural support for that statement. That's how we're supposed to be. Generous and abundant. Say this with me. I'm generous and I'm abundant. And when I give, I give out of abundance. Freely to meet needs. Because I have more than enough. Amen. Doesn't God have more than enough? Or do you think he's a little stingy? Going to come up short this week, Jesus. What are we going to do? No. God has more than enough. More than enough resources. More than enough to meet your little need. But you, my, my need's not so little. To him it is. He owns, he owns the, the cattle on a thousand hills. Don't you know that he can pay your little $200 bill? Or supply resources to help you with that. Amen? Amen? So, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are His dear children. 
Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, pleasing as a pleasing aroma to God. Well, I'll tell you what, it hot outdoors, ain't it? It hot in here. I mean, these poor air conditioners are working tonight. So what does the word imitate mean? What does the word imitate mean? It means to copy or to follow the example of someone or something. And so when you imitate someone, you try to replicate their actions, behaviors, and qualities. Does that sound like what God has asked us to do? To be more like him? So in a deeper sense, imitation involves adopting attitudes, values, and practices of the person that we're imitating. Adopting attitudes, values, and practices of the person you're imitating. You know, how many times were you parents did your children try to imitate you? Sometimes they imitated you very well and you wish they hadn't done such a good job because there were some negative uh, effects in their imitations, right? But they imitated you because they imitated your practices. They learned. Did you ever notice colloquial um, people in the South? They, they, they might have a little twang. Amen. East Texas has a big twang. You get up north. You get, you know, you get like a, in, in New York, New Jersey, they have their own accent. How war you? How war you? Right? Do you ever notice that the kids, grow, let's say growing up in New York, when they get to be an adult, they don't go around, hey, yo, how y'all doing? They talk just like their parents. They have that same deep, when you get in the Midwest, there's a Midwestern accent. And then when you get out on the West Coast, hanging, dude. Amen. But where'd they learn that? In their home. Hallelujah. And so they're imitators. They're picking up the colloquial uh, um, accents that are part. I mean, you don't see anybody from England. Hallelujah. Growing up in England, all of a sudden, they're going, hey, y'all. Why? Because that was in their home. They're imitators of what they've heard over the years, and they've put it to practice. And so their attitudes, values, and practice of the person that you are imitating. So in the context of faith, especially when the Bible instructs believers to imitate God or maybe to imitate Christ, it means to strive to live in a way that reflects God's characters and actions in your life. And so what would this include? This would include living with love because God is love. Amen. God is love. He's not going to be love. He is love. Amen. And so because he is love, it means that we have to demonstrate selfishness, sacrificial love towards others, just as Jesus did. It would include, I believe, practicing what we call holiness. That's a word we don't hear much anymore. And it means to, to strive to live a pure and righteous life reflecting God's holiness. You know, Jesus said, be ye holy as I am holy. That word holy is separate. You are to live a separated life. In other words, you're not to live like the world lives because you're no longer of that kingdom. You're of the kingdom of God. You should learn how to adapt into the culture of heaven and then learn to live in that culture. And so many Christians, they adapt into salvation, but they don't adapt into the culture of heaven. Because the culture of heaven goes well beyond just being saved. It is, it is taking on the attitudes and the val values and the practices of our Heavenly Father. It is imitating what God does, how He lives, how He breathes, how He speaks, how He loves. That's what we are to imitate. And we might not have grown up in His household, but when we accepted Christ, we moved into His household. Amen? And so then we are to accept not only the, the beliefs and the values, but we are to put them into practice. And that's where renewing our mind comes in, where, where, where the Bible talks about to renew your mind. Hallelujah. 
to, to, because you have to take what was in there and fill it with God's word so you know how to act. It's like going to school. You didn't learn ma- arithmetic in just kindergarten because, um, you know, it's a con- constant process of learning. And so you have first, second, third, fourth, and everything builds upon it. <clears throat> Learning, to, you know, everybody thinks when you get born again, you ought to be a, a mature Christian, but it don't work that way. We grow and we develop, and it takes work, it takes study, it takes reflection, it takes meditation, it takes putting the Word to practice in our life, seeing it work over and over and over, and then getting behind people that are living as practical examples so that you can see the love of God, how it's supposed to operate, how it's supposed to manifest, amen? God is a spirit, we are a spirit, and inside of us is is the Spirit of God who confirms that, that, that our our spirit is alive unto God, but our natural man has a voice. Our natural man wants to do the things that the flesh wants to always have done. It wants to, to go against the laws and commandments of God. And you're not going to know if it's right or wrong unless you're in the Word, developing and studying and growing, and then the Word of God leads you and guides you and then protects you as well. And so it's important that we practice holiness, that's, that, we, that we strive to live pure and righteous before God, reflecting God's holiness. Amen? Amen. Some of the things, I'll be honest with you, some of the things I've done in my life and some of the things I see people that are still doing in the church, they don't reflect the holiness of God. They don't reflect our Father. They don't reflect His goodness. They don't reflect His mercy. You can say Amen. We're all in that category. We've done things that we know are wrong, but thank God for 1 John 1, 9. But we as a church have got to rise up. We've got to stand up, and we've got to declare that, that, that God, that Jesus, that's not our Lord, but that we live, that, he, that well, He's not just our Savior, He's our Lord. Do you know the word Lord means one who reigns and rules over another? Well, I ain't going to have nobody reign and rule over me, especially a man. Well, Jesus, if he's not reigning and ruling over your life, if you haven't given your whole life over to him, hallelujah, then he's just your savior. And you're going to have issues in life because you're, you're going to be of a rebellious nature, of a rebellious spirit. And when he asks you to do something or his word commands you to do something, I'm not going to do that. You're not going to walk in the fullness of the counsel of the almighty God. You're not honoring him, you're disrespecting him. And yet we've come, the Bible says, we're to be imitators of him. We're to live a pure and righteous life, which then reflects God's holiness. We're also to exemplify compassion, meaning that we're to show kindness and mercy and forgiveness. Man, I tell you what, that's an area that I can fall short in. Hallelujah. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You're the same way. Maybe not you, but most of us... You know, we have our moments where we're kind and merciful, and then we have our moments where just get out of our way, brother, because God's grace is not going to be evident at the moment. Amen? (laughs) Hallelujah. I mean, I'm just being real here. Living blessed. So the next thing that we see is is that we need to be generous. Give freely and abundantly as God provides for us. Imitating God or imitating Christ is about aligning our life with the values and behaviors that models, that, that God models in the Bible. What this does is it allows, uh, allows those divine qualities then to become evident in our everyday life. What it, was it Paul said that we are living epistles seen and read by all? People are watching you. People are watching your speech. People are watching your actions. They're watching your face. Oh, I've got the joy, grumpy pants. Hallelujah. They're watching what happens when you get into trouble or under tribulation and trial and things may not be going well for you at work. They're looking at how you react because all day long you're professing you're a believer and all day long you're professing you're a Christian until pressure's put on you. And then your Christianity takes a dive And the satanic process of your fallen nature arises. Hallelujah. Another good place. I think I'm preaching pretty good tonight, don't you? Cora, come home. (laughs) And so, again, we have to allow those divine qualities to be evident in our everyday life. And so, 
for me, again, going back to uh, what I stated earlier, tell me yours, I'll tell you mine. Um, my goal is twofold, if you will, for wanting to be successful. Number one, to live a good and comfortable life. Again, coming back to number two is that I want to help bring people into the kingdom of God. Amen. To use my resources to help supply God's kingdom and His work. These are my heart motives. These aren't just not empty words. Oh, it sounds good. Hallelujah. You know, we're just talking to Christianity or, you know, what they call it, Christian babble. Um, these are actually my heart, mo my heart motives. This is what's my purpose. This is what drives me. This is what I want to see. I want to see people come to Jesus. I want to see lives change and hearts, tr uh, ch and hearts transformed into the gospel. I just don't want it to be empty words that, you know, they say a word just to get out of church and you never see them again. I want to see the same transformation in them that was in me. That one day I was, I was an evangelist for Satan and the next day I was in church praising God because I knew that I received something that, that was so great that it was beyond anything I could ever think or imagine. And then because of that, because of that transformation, doesn't mean my life has been easy. Doesn't mean that there haven't been times that I got angry at God, which was wrong. Doesn't mean that there were times maybe that I, I got out of church for a short season of time. But it means that when the doors were open, I was in the house of God. Because as for me and my house, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up into the house. I'll be really honest with you in the house of the Lord. I'll be really honest with you. When, when we were younger, you know, we didn't have all these television cameras. We didn't have live streaming. If you were going to be part of what was happening in the church, you needed to be there because the moment that the, the Sunday that I wasn't there, the next Sunday, oh, you missed it. Oh, my goodness. God showed up. Well, God shows up every day, but they would have, would have I didn't want to miss anything God was doing. Hallelujah. I would, I would arrange my schedule. I took a job one time when the first thing they told me was, uh, you're going to have to give up Wednesday nights. And for a season, I gave up Wednesday nights. And, and then I finally went back and said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm no longer, I mean, I'm going to be in church, period. I put, what, why? Because I'm putting God first. I'm putting his house first. I'm, I'm realizing the education that I need to grow and develop. Hallelujah. And I'm also not being disobedient to the word of God. It says, do not forsake the gathering together as it is the habit of some. I'm building a good habit. My parents, even though we grew up denominational, I tell you, we were in church every Sunday. I, I mean, every Sunday. They built in me a good habit and the importance of being in church. And though, even though I'm no longer part of that denomination, it was still ingrained in me the importance of honoring God and reverencing God by being in the house of God, fellowshipping with other believers. We're a family. Amen? Amen. That's all free. And so, again, these are my heart motives to supply resources for the kingdom of God and his work. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will be overflow with good wine. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you do. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 and 9 says this, You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly in response to pressure or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. In other words, we can say it like this. He loves a cheerful giver. Amen. I mean, there have been times God's asked me to give. I just said, oh, no. But I had to, I had to rectify my heart. There are times when there's a lot of pressure coming from satanic activity that's deriving um, or taking from your household. And God says, you know what? Uh, I want you to step it up a little bit and I want you to give this amount. And you go, oh no. But I've learned that when God asks, I'm, I'm coming to the throne happy, cheerful. And so... When God is coming to ask you to do something, 
Our response shouldn't be, oh, no. Our, sh our response should be, hallelujah, another opportunity to put seed in the ground because you can see beyond what I can see. I can only see immediately in front of me, but you see my future. And you said that, that I know the plans that I have for you. They're plans of good and, 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 and plans to bless you and to prosper you. And so you're asking me to do something in the, in the here and now because you see what's coming tomorrow and I need seed in the ground so it needs to come to harvest at that particular point in time. Because the Bible says that again, coming back to Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, that my fruit will not, will not drop off the vine before it's time. And so when God asks you to put seed in the ground, there's a reason he's asking you to put seed in the ground. He sees the future better and you see the path and he's, he knows that you're going to need a harvest out there in the future to cover what's coming. Hallelujah. So be cheerful about it. Woohoo! I tell you, Pastor Kim was telling me we got to go plant some more seeds and I got to tear it, you know, fallow the ground up. And I'm going, you know how much work that is? It's hot. Instead of being, oh boy, hallelujah, an opportunity to sow seed because there's coming a harvest. Amen. There's coming a harvest. There's coming a harvest. When you put seed in the ground, there's coming a harvest. So be cheerful when God asks you. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. I like the plenty left over. Hallelujah. And I like the sharing with others because that aligns with my purpose. That aligns with my heart. How about you? I mean... And what these, verses, what these verses do is they encourage us as believers to use our resources generously and yet wisely with the understanding that doing so honors God and supports His work. And what this does, it, it leads to blessing and provision in return. Hallelujah. Blessing and provision in return. And this leads me to my next point, <clears throat> coming back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we, we need for our enjoyment. He gives us provision for our enjoyment. Let me say that again, because maybe you didn't hear that. He gives us provision for our enjoyment. Uh, he gave me provision to pay my bills. Well, I tell you, I enjoy it when my bills are paid. He gives me provision for my enjoyment. Maybe I'd like to go see a movie. God's not dead. Hallelujah. Well, he gives me provision for my enjoyment. Maybe I'd like to go out and have me some chicken wings at Pluckers because it's a new restaurant. He gives me provision for my enjoyment. My enjoyment. Hallelujah. He gives me provision for my enjoyment. Maybe I want to take the boat out on the lake and gas prices are, are exuberantly high, but he gives me provision for my enjoyment. Maybe I want to take the boat out on the lake and it needs water in the lake. He gives me provision for my enjoyment. That lake, I don't know about you, I'm calling that lake full. Hallelujah. I'm calling rain in due season and it's due today. So he gives me provision. Hallelujah for my enjoyment. When we look at the, are you getting that point? He gives me provision. I, I hope I didn't drive it home too long and too hard, but I want you to get it. I want you to get it on the inside. He wants to provide for you for your enjoyment, for your enjoyment. Hallelujah. I tell you what, how many of you like birthdays? I mean, there's provision for your enjoyment on your birthday, right? Whether it's free food, free gifts, or better yet, free money. Hallelujah. I like it when people provide for my enjoyment. Dad, I, I want to buy you lunch. Hallelujah. I'm being provided for my enjoyment. Amen. McDonald's. <laughs> well, hallelujah. So when we look at this word enjoyment, it refers to the state or experience of taking pleasure or satisfaction in something. Are you satisfied? It is the feeling of happiness, contentment, or delight that comes from engaging in activities, experience certain moments, or experiencing certain moments, or using resources that bring joy and fulfillment. And 
When we look at enjoyment, it can be found in simple pleasures like spending time with loved ones, maybe pursuing some of your hobbies, or for some, even appreciating nature, as well as in more uh, uh, significant achievements or even experiences. And when, when we look at the addition of for our enjoyment, what this does is it highlights that God's gifts are meant just not for survival or necessity, but also for our pleasure and fulfillment. And what this does is it suggests that God cares about your happiness. And he wants us to experience joy in the blessing that he provides. Amen. Hallelujah. And so, happiness. What is happiness? <clears throat> happiness is, the endure, is an enduring state of well-being and contentment. Are you content yet? I mean... It encompasses, happiness encompasses an overall sense of satisfaction with your life, which can be influenced by many factors, including relationships, personal achievement, achievements, and even a sense of purpose. And so, how does enjoyment and happiness work together? Well, I believe that enjoyment fuels happiness. Regularly experiencing enjoyment can contribute to an overall sense of happiness. Amen. Think about it. When you consistently find pleasure in daily activities, it can lead to a more positive and contented outlook on your life. See, happiness embraces enjoyment. And when you're generally happy and content, you are more likely to find enjoyment in a wide range of activities and experiences in your life. And so we say, you know, something like a happy person tends to appreciate and savor moments of enjoyment more deeply, right? In essence, while enjoyment is about immediate pleasure of an experience, happiness is the cumulative effect of those enjoyable experiences over time leading to a lasting state of well-being. So when we look at happiness and enjoyment, these two concepts are entwined with each influencing and reinforcing each other. In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, reading from the New Living Translation, it says, a cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. And this verse highlights the positive impact of a joyful and cheerful, or what we might say a happy heart or attitude on our overall well-being, comparing it to the healing effects of medicine. A happy heart has the same healing effects as medicine. And when the Bible speaks of giving or giving us provision for our enjoyment, it means that God supplies us with what we need both materially and spiritually, just not for, for survival, but also to bring us joy and fulfillment in life. And look, this is how I think this concept can be better understood. Number one, through material uh, provision, such as our basic needs. God provides for our basic needs, right? Food, shelter, clothing, as we saw last week, so that we can live more comfortably. And what this does, this provision allows us to enjoy the good things in life without worrying about our essential needs. There's nothing like worrying. I mean, we're not supposed to worry, but some days, you know, you may find yourself thinking on the things you ought not to be thinking about. And the Bible says, uh, don't be anxious or stressed out about anything. But in everything with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. So that the peace of God which passes all, under all understanding would encompass your hearts. And so, we're not to worry about our essential needs. A cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. So how this concept can be better understood as provision for our enjoyment would be blessing beyond necessities as well. Number, God often blesses us with more than just the basics. This includes things like opportunities, relationships, relationships and experiences that bring us pleasure and then enrich our lives. For example, maybe the, the beauty of nature 
maybe meaningful work time, or how about even time spent with loved ones, are all provisions that contribute to our enjoyment of life. Number two might be uh, emotional and spiritual provision, beginning with peace and contentment. God provides us with peace and, and, and with, with peace of mind and contentment, which are crucial for enjoying life. Because when we trust God's provision, we can experience a deep sense of satisfaction and happiness regardless of our circumstances. We have joy in relationships. God gives us relationships with others, such as our families, our friends, and even people within our community that bring joy, love, and a sense of belonging. And these relationships are a significant source of enjoyment in our lives many times. We have spiritual gifts, which God provides spiritual blessings, such as the joy of knowing Him, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and the hope of eternal life. These gifts enhance our enjoyment of life on a deeper level beyond just material things. Number three, I would believe, would be something like purpose and fulfillment. We have purposeful living. God gives us a sense of purpose and calling, which leads to fulfillment and joy. Fulfillment and joy. When we live according to God's will and use our gifts and talents to serve others, we find enjoyment in the meaning, meaningfulness of our lives. And then through generosity and giving, God's provision allows us to be generous to others, which can be a source of great joy. When we share our blessings and see the positive impact it has on others, I don't know about you, but it always adds to my enjoyment. See, God's provision for our enjoyment is comprehensive. He meets our needs, enriches our lives with blessings, and fills our hearts with joy, peace, and finally contentment. And by recognizing and appreciating these provisions, we can fully enjoy the life that God has given us, and then in turn, we can share that joy with others. Coming back to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, those Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. When we see the word need here, it refers to something that is essential or necessary for a person to live, to function, or achieve a particular purpose. And needs are typically classified into different categories. Number one, our basic needs. Again, these are fundamental requirements for survival, such as food, water, shelter, and clothing. And without these, a person cannot sustain life. Then we have emotional needs. These include the need for love, companionship, security, and a sense of belonging. And meeting these needs is essential for emotional and mental well-being. Then we have our spiritual needs. Now, these are related to a person's desire for purpose, meaning, and connection with something greater than themselves, often fulfilled through faith, worship, and spiritual practices. We have social needs. These include the needs for relationship, community, social interaction. Humans inherently are, are, are and by design, are, are social beings. And because of that, we have social needs and we, we have a sense for connection and, our, and identity within society. And then number five, I think there, it would be uh, psychological needs. And these, these needs are related to mental health, and they include the need for self-esteem, achievement, um, autonomy, and then fulfillment. And so if we combine all these and summarize it a, in the word of a need, then it's something that is crucial for a person's well-being, survival, or fulfillment in various aspects of life, whether physical, emotional, social, or spiritual. And God provides all we need. And so what this does is this part then underscores that God provides exactly Amen. what we need. And this doesn't necessarily mean he gives us everything we want, but rather everything that is necessary for our well-being and the fulfillment of his purpose in our lives. Again, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19 tells us, and this is the same God who takes care of me and will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. 
So here in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, needs are understood broadly to include everything that is essential for a person's overall well-being, material, spiritual, emotional, and psychological. And what this verse does, it's a promise that, that God in His abundance through Christ will meet all these needs according to His, uh, His riches and glory, His unlimited resources. Again, the f this phrase, his riches and glory refers to the immeasurable and infinite resources, blessings and wealth that God po possesses and makes available to us, his people. The riches of God's glory are vast and beyond human comprehension, encompassing both material and then spiritual abundance and blessing as well. And so it encompasses everything that we need everything that we need for life and godliness, both in this world and also in the next. And it's important to note that these riches are infinite, eternal, and freely given to those who trust in Him, ensuring then that every need, material, spiritual, or otherwise, will be met in abundance. You see, our goal here isn't to get you all hyped up about success at the cost of your spiritual life, Instead, it's to help you develop a generous spirit just like God's. To be generous just like God's. And so, to be generous, you first need to understand how much God wants to bless you with success so that you have something to give. You have something to give. But to succeed in the way God intends, you need a strong personal relationship with Jesus that is built on His Word. Jesus needs to be the Lord of your life, not just your Savior. Not just in theory, but in your everyday reality. Jesus needs to be the Lord of your life. And it's important, I believe, for the body of Christ to understand God's will for our success. But here there's even a greater truth. There's even a greater truth that we need to explore. And that is the importance of having a heart that's fully committed to Jesus and the gospel. So I encourage you tonight in our call to action as we journey through the study on, on finances and God's will for our lives, I encourage you to truly reflect on the motives behind your desire for success. Are you seeking to honor God, to be a good steward, and be a blessing to others? Or are there other motivations in your life that are at play? God's blessings are not just meant to enrich our lives, but to flow through us to bless the world around us. I want to say that again. God's blessings are just not meant to enrich our lives, but they're to flow through us to bless the world around us. That's why it's crucial to align our hearts with His purpose, embracing a generous spirit that reflects His own, His own attributes. Amen? So, I challenge you today. Take a moment to examine, to examine your heart and ask yourself, why do I seek success? How can I use the blessing God gives me to further His kingdom and to make a difference in the lives of others? Let's commit together to living a blessed, to be a blessing mindset, to live that out. Just not to have it just an empty word, but to live it out to live out a blessed to a blessing mindset, using our resources just not for our own enjoyment, but to advance God's work and spread His love to those in need. Remember tonight as well that God provides abundantly and generously, and He calls us to do the same. And as we continue to study this particular subject matter, let's explore what it means to live with a heart fully committed to Jesus, understanding that true success is found in aligning our lives with His will. So let me ask you this question. Are you ready to take that step? Are you ready to take that step? Hallelujah. And so we're going to dive deeper in the next few weeks into God's Word, and we're going to discover how we can use our blessings to impact the world for His glory around us. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of study and reflection on your word. As we seek to understand your will for our lives, especially in the area of finances and success, we ask you for your wisdom and guidance tonight. Help us to align our hearts with your purpose, 
knowing that every blessing we receive comes from your generous hand. Oh, Father, you're so good. Lord, we desire to live lives that honor you, not just in our words, but in our actions. As, as Paul said, that we, just not, that, that we are a living epistle, seen and read by all. Teach us to be good stewards of the resources you've entrusted with us, using them to bless others and advance your kingdom. And Father, I pray that our motives be pure, driven by a desire to glorify you and share your love with the world. And as we go our separate ways tonight, <clears throat> may the lessons we've learned continue to shape our hearts and minds. Fill us with your peace and joy and contentment and help us to reflect your generosity in all we do. We trust in your provision tonight, Lord, and we commit to walking in your ways. So we thank you for your endless love and your abundant blessings that you pour into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Never like to close a service without giving you an opportunity, whether you're here in the house or maybe you're watching through any one of our social media platforms, you know, to, ex to accept, to declare, to confess Jesus as your Lord. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 just says this. If we'll open and declare that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and believe that in our heart, if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, we will be saved. That Greek word saved means to be made whole, to be complete, to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of your dear son. If you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I invite you to pray this prayer right now with me. Make heaven your home. Make God your Father. And Jesus will come in and become Lord of your life. Pray this prayer with me right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and become Lord of my life. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. From this moment forward, I'm born again. I'm on my way to heaven. And I'm a new creation of Christ. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, I want to welcome you into the kingdom of God. Something miraculous and wonderful is happening in your life right now. And that's Jesus coming in and introducing himself to you. I encourage you to do two things. Number one, find yourself a good Bible-believing church. If you're in the San Antonio area, man, His Grace Church is such a place. We're a young, growing, dynamic group of believers, man, where everybody can know your name. I tell you what, it's a good place to come in, get hooked up, and start your spiritual journey. You, you, can, you can find friendships, relationships, socialization, and encouragement, as well as spiritual growth. And so His Grace Church is a destination for divine visitation, where miracles are still happening today. We're a place where, where we're teaching and training and demonstrating the Word of God. And that's just the type of place you need to be. Some place that can help instruct you to live according to God's promises which is above and not beneath and you can become the head and not the tail through the knowledge of the word of God so come check us out we're located in the far west part of San Antonio in the 151 410 corridor 6995 Alamo Downs Parkway San Antonio Texas you can find our our location on our on our interactive map on our website at www.hgc.church or hgcchurch.com under locations man We'd love to have you come and be a part of this growing body of believers. And so, um, I, hey, and the other thing I encourage you to do is check out our digital resources page on our website under resources. And uh, we have a, Pastor Kim and I put together a short uh, video uh, series called The New Birth. It'll just help you get a little understanding. There are about 10 videos, five to seven minutes long on exactly what's happening. No in-depth teaching, just a high-level synopsis so you can kind of uh, kick off your spiritual walk with God uh, and, 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 and understand some of the things going on. Uh, Sunday morning, 10 a.m., 10.30 a.m. for our Sunday morning worship celebration. We're going to be right back here, Pastor Kim and the worship team. And man, we're going to connect with God through music and worship. If you like to sing, hallelujah. If you can't sing, it don't matter. Come on, there's other people drown you right out. And so we'll, uh, we'll be kicking off our Sunday morning worship celebration, 1030 a.m. I'll tell you what, I guarantee you Jesus is going to be here. Well, how do you know Jesus is going to be here, Pastor? Because the Bible says wherever two or three are gathered in his name, he's there in the midst of them. He guaranteed it. As the old saying goes, I guarantee it. He guarantees he'll be here. And when Jesus is in the house, the miraculous happens. Lives are changed and hearts are, are forever um, uh, changed as well. And so uh, hearts are, are just 
transformed in the presence of our God. And so come be a part of our Sunday morning worship celebration right here at 1030 a.m. Central Standard Time. If you can't join us on campus and, and, and you're not in the city, then I invite you to, to man, hook up with us through our social media platform. We're on Facebook. We live stream every Sunday morning and Thursday night on Facebook, our YouTube channel and Rumble. And so... Um, if you don't, if you don't uh, follow us on Facebook, man, follow us. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and um, also uh, subscribe to Rumble if you do it that way. We are on X. We don't live stream through X, but we do our postings and, and uplifting encouragement, things like that. So, but Facebook is the best place uh, to be a part of what we're doing uh, as well. And so, man, we're so appreciative of your support and we love you. Pastor Kim and I are just so happy that you're part of what we're doing here at His Grace Church. And uh, I tell you what, we believe that God has something Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something unique to say to you this week, and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. I'm Pastor Michael Pillmore. This is His Grace Church, a destination for divine visitation where miracles are still happening today. I'll see you right back here Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m.